In crime fiction, detectives use procedure, induction, deduction, and logic to solve crimes. But how about maths? How about quintic equations? What are quintic equations? Me and my excellent guest for this episode, Michelle Dieter, will get into answering a few of these questions and lots more literature and translation related questions in the excellent interview that we did together. I'm Angus Stewart, and you're listening to episode 16 of the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast. The book we're looking at today is The Untouched Crime by Chen Zijin, or as he's named on the cover of the book, Zijin Chen. It was published by Amazon Crossing, a really interesting publisher of all sorts of languages into English uh, fiction, translated fiction, but they have a very interesting and diverse range of Chinese to English titles, and a lot of them are genre fiction. This is our second genre fiction book we're looking at on the podcast, also the second crime fiction, the first one in each case being uh, A Perfect Crime by IE. So this is kind of a sequel to this episode, and certainly the first of many that will be about genre fiction, because the next few episodes after this are going to be a sci-fi series, or sci-fi season. I haven't picked whether I'm going for the UK word or the US word. Probably season sounds more cool. I'll probably default to that. But yeah, anyway, before we charge on with the interview, just the, the standard plugs. So if you want to contact me about any of your thoughts on previous episodes or things you hear in this episode, or if you just want to get updates on the show and learn a little bit about what's coming out before I, uh, what's coming out in an episode before I post it, there's the podcast's Instagram at trchfic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. And there's my Twitter, which is Angus Likes Words. Yeah, that's how you can get in touch with me. And if you'd like to support the show, there's two places you can do it. There's buymeacoffee.com slash Trisha Fick. That'll be linked in the show notes. That's for a one-off contribution. And there is the Patreon, which is for a monthly contribution, although you can sign up for a month and then quit if you are a cunning economist. And the Patreon has a feed of bonus content. I recently put up a whole, I think an hour-long bonus episode where I talk about the, uh, well, I give kind of my account of the Lead Center for New Chinese Writings Genre Fiction Symposium, so relevant to this episode, and actually that's where this episode came about, as you'll learn in the interview. And there's also a variety of more like 15-minute kind of mini bonus shows um, covering such interesting topics as Lu Xun's moustache and his essay on his moustache, uh, Chinese Dining in Edinburgh is one, there's a short story by IE called The Curse that I give my thoughts on. That's um, that's a fun one. Of course, you can read the story on the Lead Center's uh, website. It's up there translated. If you want to hear my thoughts, it's on the Patreon. So enough waffle from me. Without further ado, let's play the interview. So I've got Michelle Dieter on the show. She co-translated Shu Jiwen's Paper Tiger with our last guest, Nikki Harmon. And for Amazon Crossing, she translated Feng Tang's Beijing Beijing. And also another innocuous, innocuous little novel called The Untouched Crime, the one we're talking about today. So how's your morning going, Michelle? Yeah, pretty well. Mm -hmm. Are you down in, correct me if I'm wrong, is it Manchester that you're down in? Yeah, we had a pretty good weekend that was nice and sunny, but now we're back to regular rainy, it figures. Mm -hmm. We're kind of the opposite here in Dundee. We had horrible rain and grey skies and now, right now... It seems civilized. I'm sure it'll become horrible and dark again soon. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we too, we met for the first time uh, at the Lead Center for New Chinese Writing Symposium on genre fiction. Just was that about a week ago or is it yeah. two weeks now? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really not good at measuring the passing of time. Um, if any of you guys listening hadn't heard about this thing before or you'd heard but you're not sure what went on, uh, there is a good write-up on that event in Chinese by one of the attendees, Liu, Liu Guanzhao. He posted it on uh, WeChat, but there are links to it on Twitter. Uh, I think I retweeted something about it. And there's also an English language one, which I also retweeted. Uh, that's from Nick Stember. And if you want an audio version and you're uh, willing to fork out a whopping one US dollar for it, there is a rambling audio account on this podcast's Patreon feed. Um, but for the benefit of people who haven't checked such things out already, um, Michelle, how was your experience at that uh, symposium? How did it go for you? 
I thought it was really good. I think it was one of my favorites of the things that Leeds University has organized that I was able to attend. Um, we had some very special guest speakers, including two representatives from Head of Zeus. Mm. And I don't have as much publishing experience, so I really like to learn how they see things, how they uh, try to acquire books or try to balance the really difficult um, challenges of getting something interesting, but also making sure that it's marketable. Yeah, you could definitely see that um, there was a little bit of a gap in perspective between you guys, the kind of, I don't know, technical minded translators and these guys with their maybe the, the good business sense, but the not fully formed picture of China, I guess. So but it's then, nice to yeah. have a chance to build the bridge. Exactly. And then see things from people who are academics or partially academics because they're readers too at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. it's nice to get a more full perspective. Otherwise, as a freelancer, I'm just sitting in my little bubble. Yep, yeah. sitting in one's room. So is there anything else I should mention about yourself or your work before we kind of march on? Um, well, I have a website, so if you want to know all about me, you can go to www.michellededer.com. <laughs> mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not somebody who posts regularly, so just check me out there. Cool, and we'll talk a wee bit more about you and your work at the end of the podcast as well for people who are curious. Yeah, keep listening, guys. Keep listening. Yes, stay till the end, please. Or if you have to go, come back. Um, so before I actually grill you about the book we're doing, Chen Zijin's, Chen Zijin's book. Um, I understand that you recently binge listened. I don't know if it's all 15 episodes of the podcast, but you've been charging through and you do have some thoughts of your own. Certainly in the early episodes, I was begging people to give me some feedback and criticism. So did you have any points you wanted to address about things that had been discussed by myself or guests on the show? Sure. I think that... Um... The show covers a lot of ground, um, but I'm really Sorry, excited dogs. yeah, about how you're willing to cover books from different eras and throw out theories that make me sit and think for a little bit. Um, like this idea of Liu Meng literature, um, I feel like there's a lot of books out there that I would put in that bucket, maybe. Mm. And if you talk to somebody like Nikki Harmon, you could argue that too many of the books that are being translated right now are written by men, and the protagonist is a guy that can get away with just about anything. Um, sure, I've read a few already. Exactly. So I would say that uh, the genre, or maybe a different version of that genre, is still alive and well. Uh, Nikki calls it naughty boy literature, which is a very <laughs> British type of way of saying it. <laughs> yeah, an understatement. Yeah, well, because I don't know. I think wish fulfillment is maybe a little bit much, but... I still think there is um, a place for that in Chinese literature, whereas in the U.S. and in the U.K., that's um, not necessarily something that people are looking for. So that's yeah. a challenge when you're looking for a book that was popular in China and you think will be popular in another market. Yeah, or, or there might be a market for it here, but it wouldn't end up at the top of the, you know, the lists and the piles. And if we were having our literature translated and exported abroad, that wouldn't be the stuff that was getting precedence. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'm not sure if we need to make sure we pick the best, the classics to be translated. Mm. But at the same time, it takes so much love, so much effort to get a single book out there. You want to make sure it's something worthwhile, whether or sure. not it's a top book or a, you know, rated 100% book. <laughs> yeah. I um, The only reason I learned about that term, Liu Mang, was... It was the thing of having finished, um, I think it was Wang Shuo, but I'd also read the Murong Shui Sun book not long after. And so I went looking on the internet to see what there was about Wang Shuo. And being a master's student at the time, I stuck his name into JSTOR. And that mm -hmm. turned up an essay on Liu Mang and piece of literature and all this stuff about authors and main characters just wanting to eschew their responsibilities and hang out with their gumen, their bros. And it seemed yeah. like a really interesting category, but then, yeah, you look at how many of the books we get from Chinese into English that kind of fit that category, but also how it, like, I think I, so I, I asked, um, after, after the symposium, I asked a group of people that went, we went to the pub together and I asked them, uh, is Neil Mang and pizza books, are they still a thing? And the answer I got was the word isn't used anymore, but I think, was it yourself that was thinking 
the words may be not used, but the thing itself has evolved and still kind of exists. Yeah, that is definitely what I would say, just based on who's getting a chance to write books and what people are reading. As far as I can tell, it's still still going on. And, you know, it might just end up being categorized under a different genre because of the platform. But when I look at it, I think, yeah, 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 that's the same bucket for me. <laughs> Although to play, not, well, not even playing devil's advocate, because this is an opinion I agree with, but like an opinion from the other side, I think a lot of Westerners in their mind, if they think of China, the image that's still conjured is North Korea or Stalinist Russia. So to, to pick up a book and there's full of crazy behavior and debauchery, whether or not it's, you know, PC or not PC, it's at least challenges some western preconceptions but maybe in a slightly problematic way interesting point we'll have to get into that a little bit more later if we have time yes we are waffling a bit aren't we (laughs) (laughs) another Um, thing that i wanted to talk about was the academic publishers i think this is something that dylan levi king mentioned yes um how popular are they really i mean if i'm looking at my own bookshelf which i did this morning i would say um they're not popular at all But then again, Mm. all the books that I have are from 2012 or later. Um, And I'm not, you know, I'm not teaching any classes in literature. So I don't buy books based on their academic uh, merit. I buy books based on what I want to read or what somebody has told me about. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have about nine publishers here. Mm. Um, Five of the books in my house that are translated fiction are from Head of Zeus. Right. Four are Amazon Crossing, two are Ballastier, two are Penguin Random House, Mm -hmm. and then we have 46, Walker Books, One World, Two Lines, Anchor Books, MacLahoe's, East Slope Pub, which is from Hong Kong, right? and Hope Road. So quite a diverse set there. Yeah, absolutely. And so you can tell, I mean, maybe that's because the books I'm reading are books that are just designed for the ordinary reader, as we were talking about at the symposium. Mm Mm-hmm. But I would say that even smaller presses like Ballastier um, are kind of heavy hitting. Like they put out several books a year and they might not be super successful, but they make up part of the scene, part of the landscape. Yeah, I think it, it's notable to say um, the publishers that do books from China often do the best are not specialists of Chinese to English uh, translation or books like the head of Zeus. Maybe they are. Now they certainly because of their site their Chinese sci-fi books they certainly didn't set out to be and I guess even Amazon Crossing they're not specifically a China publisher even if they are a translated fiction publisher. That's a really good point. Yeah, I mean what I learned only a few years ago was that books don't get bought unless you promote them, mm. and it sounds so obvious, but some of these smaller publishers just don't have the budget to promote like that. And then it's, you know, it's maybe a one in a hundred, one in a thousand chance that some really committed writer, a reader gets into your book and then tells the whole world about it and it's a runaway success. Mm -hmm. Curious about your Penguin books. Are they classics? Are they like um, kind of the standardized Penguin design? Um, So they say Viking on the top. Can you tell us what the difference between Viking and Penguin is? Oh, this is where I'm going to show my ignorance. Uh, Viking Viking will be one of their, um, their imprints. One of the kind of, yeah, I don't know, it's hard to say where, whether it's a company or not, but basically one of the companies under the Penguin umbrella. And my ignorance is not knowing specifically what the Viking brand is or what kind of books they do. Right. Pretty sure it tends to be literary, prestigious things, but okay. a, lot, a lot of them, I don't know, they have one or two specialities. So they'll do their prestigious books, but then they'll also have a certain kind of commercial one. But um, yeah, if potential employers are listening, they'll be shaking their heads at me for not knowing <laughs> What exactly is Viking do? Well, please write in and tell us what's going on. <laughs> what's now, these the... two books are yeah. um, Black Holes by He Jia Hong, translated by Emily Jones. Oh, right. Yeah. And Good Night Rose by Chu Zi Jian, uh, translated by Poppy Tolan. Black Holes, that's another crime book, right? Yeah, and that was published, I think, in 2011. So more recent, can't be considered a classic just yet, but maybe eventually. Okay, well... There's more chance, if, if anyone listening has their own thoughts on the matter, please do contact uh, any of the details I leave in the show notes via Twitter, Instagram, all that fun stuff. Um, there was another point you wanted to raise about whether or not you can substantially change a book in translation. Is that right? 
Yes, I'm really interested in this topic because I think that um, it's something that I grew to realize over the past six years or so. So the very first book I translated was very challenging, Beijing, Beijing, and I didn't change much at all. But mm. since I've done more translation, since I've read other people's work, I realized, oh, actually, changing a book more is okay as long as you're checking with the author and they think it's a good idea. Mm. So we recently met Stanley Chan or Chen Chou Fun. Yes. And he wrote Waste Tide, which was translated by the amazing, amazing translator author Ken Liu. Yeah. And according to Stanley, the book, when it went from Chinese into English, was changed um, pretty substantially. He said 30% was changed. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe this is just, you know, when you're on stage, you end up exaggerating things a little bit. But I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, entire paragraphs or even pages were changed because Ken Leo was thinking about issues of um, making one of the characters, Mimi, sound less um, less like a damsel in distress and yeah. more like someone who can take care of herself because in the end, she is a very strong person. But what happened was basically Ken Leo had ideas about how to make the book work better for readers in the U.S. And he would, every time, he would tell Stanley, why he thought this change was helpful, why it might make the book even better. Stanley thought about it, agreed to it, and now they're going to change the Chinese book to be closer to the English translation. Yeah, although I guess in that case you have a, a translator who's also a, an author and a very talented, successful published author. Yeah, I think that's almost necessary. So a lot of people respect Ken Leo because he translates um, a lot of really interesting science fiction and also he is an author himself so he goes through the same struggles that authors go through when mm -hmm. he's that you know basically powerful not only is it easy for him to convince the translator that this might be good for the book overall but he can also kind of just inform the publisher um, I'm thinking these changes are going to work better and the book can be better marketed better for the book Mm. So I think the publisher uh, then is more than happy to give him a little bit of room to be creative in that area or to keep going back and forth about thinking, okay, is this something that is absolutely crucial in the story or not? And how will this be reflected or how will people see this on the English side? Yeah. So yeah, I, I hope someday I become a super powerful, amazing translator. And the next books I translate, I can kind of have a thought of, you know, does this book represent values that um, Americans and British people value? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, why am I translating it? Or, you know, if it doesn't, is there a way to kind of mute yeah. that a little bit or adjust that a little bit? Um, Although I mean, there's, a, yeah. there's a very obvious counter argument there. Why, mm -hmm. why we read books from the other side of the world in a different culture if you want them to adhere to your country's values, you know? Absolutely. So the question for me then is like, you know, China can publish whatever it wants. And if their readers love it, that's great. Why do I think this book needs to be translated? If I think it's so problematic that actually I don't enjoy it, then maybe I shouldn't translate it. <laughs> sure. If I think that it shows a side of China that people don't know about, or it's a universal story, but has these really interesting um, characters and settings that make it also representative of China then excellent, that's perfect. But mm -hmm. I mean, even in The Untouched Crime, we have a couple of things where, since it was my second book, I asked the author, do we need to keep this exactly the way you had it or can we do some adjustments? And he was like, oh yeah, those adjustments sound good. And I think for the book overall, making those changes, probably like a 2% of the book in total were worthwhile. That's cool. Are um, those adjustments kind of Secret seems a strong word, but would you be happy to give an example of one of them? Yeah, definitely. So there's two kind of main adjustments that I would probably mention as examples. One of them was that the English version is shorter. Okay. Um, so the Chinese version was published as an online serial. And ah. so it just like every chapter had to kind of reestablish things or um, it would be padded a little bit because that way the author could make enough money to survive. Right. And in a book that we expect the English readers to be reading in one sitting or maybe three or four sittings, we don't need so much padding. It's just, it's not fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the point of genre fiction is to have a little bit of fun, I think. Sure. 
So we cut out um, kind of repetitions or things that referred back to a previous chapter that we could expect the reader to probably know about. Yep. And then the other thing that we changed, um, fairly early on, Professor Yen steps into a lift or elevator, depending on your English style, mm -hmm. um, and it has poop in it. <laughs> yep. This is, I mean, I guess poop is funny in most cultures, but they really drew it out in the Chinese version. <laughs> yeah. Pages and pages. And I was just, oh, <laughs> struggling. Mm. So I didn't want to cut it completely. Again, we're talking about if this is something in another culture, you know, isn't it worthwhile to put it in the English culture as well? Um, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But maybe we don't need to spend 20 pages on it. Maybe we can spend four pages on it. Yeah. So, that was cut down. Everything that happens in the original still happens in the English. But rather than saying again and again, oh, his face was red. He felt so embarrassed. We just kind of simplified it a little bit. So those were two fairly big changes. That I think, I think that's very understandable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which goes, I, though, into the editing point. Like part of the reason why good translators will sometimes make the English book shorter is because the Chinese book didn't get a good chance to be edited sometimes. Uh -huh, yes, which leads us into the next point. Um, the, I think this had been mentioned on the podcast before with one of the previous guests. Yes. It was some speculation on our part, the Western kind of sides part, or a suspicion or a speculation that Chinese books maybe don't get as much editorial attention as uh, books in the West or the Anglosphere do. And I think the previous theory that I think I floated it with absolutely no knowledge, just absolute speculation was maybe because the books aren't, ex I don't have as much market demand on them because there's some state ownership of the publishers. Maybe there's not as much need to tweak them. But um, I think you had a, a different theory based on kind of turnover, how quickly the publishers put the books out. Is that right? Yeah, I think um, if we think back to the symposium of something that ACA said, another yeah. publisher that has one foot in China and one foot in the UK, let's say, um, they say that publishing in the UK takes forever because it takes one to two years. Mm -hmm. And I think that standard is about the same in the US, whereas in China, everything just takes two to three months. So the authors can be pressed to hurry up and finish things, or um, sometimes the editing process is cut short or maybe it seems to not happen at all mm -hmm. so forget a de developmental editor there might not be an editor checking for consistency um, right there's always somebody that checks for proofreading type of mistakes but there's not somebody that's checking for um, whether the story flows whether it's consistent or whether somebody has the same pair of glasses throughout it's like hang on didn't yeah. they always wear this pair of glasses? I don't know, as an example. I think um, the technical terms I learned for that on my publishing masters are line editing and substantive editing. So the line right. by line stuff, that's your line editing, typos essentially in grammar. And then the big, anything big picture, including, I guess, consistency, but mm. also more abstract, abstract concepts like what's the theme of the book? That would be your substantive edit. Yeah, so I think kind of the... The way that publishers work in China, as far as I can tell, is that if they can put out a lot of books quickly and make an okay margin on that, that's better than trying to lovingly craft a book and hope that that one book gets read by a huge amount of the population. Mm -hmm. And if That's this, my theory. Yeah. yeah. If this book started as a web novel as well, then I'm guessing, Chen Sejin, the burden of editing both line editing and substantive editing is on him and then that's a bonus for the publisher because they pick up the book and they'll maybe perhaps see it as a pre-edited pre-polished product that they just need to put a cover on and that's a really good point yeah yeah but the same thing happened with leave me alone right with moon rong he yeah. had that online first and then it turned into something that was more like a book mm -hmm. yeah i noticed the um or now that you've mentioned it i noticed the the chapter length and layout was kind of similar yeah good point yeah but yeah um i think we've got some really good chat out of those points you got from listening back and seeing what things needed to be questioned so i think we're probably ready to charge on and talk about the story itself sure if that's all right so first things first what's the elevator pitch for the untouched crime Hmm. So there's two ways to read this book. And I think when I was translating it, I used way number one. And rereading it more recently, I think I would maybe use way number two. Yeah. 
So I think this could be a book about a young migrant worker named Hui Ru who accidentally gets involved in a murder and has to use her wits to outsmart the police with another side story. Or you could read it as a story about Luo Wen, an incredibly intelligent and hardworking person who doesn't know how to express his emotions, mm. um, who somehow gets involved in murder and um, could potentially outsmart the police for the rest of his life, but he has to decide um, what his values really are. And the reader also has to decide if they think Luo Wen is doing the right thing or if maybe he's um, taking things too far. Yeah, I think that that raises an interesting point that the book kind of shifts around with who the main character might be or even who your two main characters and the kind of antagonism might be. And you can kind of see it on the blurb because the first paragraph of the blurb says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing, there's a serial killer somewhere loose in Hangzhou. Yeah. The second paragraph describes Law Wen's... Mm -hmm. uh, intervening uh, in a, a, a young lady who's stabbed a thug to death in self-defense and then he covers up the crime and then the third paragraph introduces Yan Liang, uh, yeah, Yan Liang uh, a criminologist who's going to try and find out what happened and then the last paragraph sets up Yan, Yan Liang and Luo Wen as kind of opposites in a cat and mouse but that last part about the cat and mouse isn't really it does eventually become what the book's about, but not until about halfway through. Yeah, and I think, well, like, you need somebody super, super smart to be able to defeat a super, super smart person. Mm -hmm. So I guess in some ways I understand why the publisher thought that was the main part of the story. Um, but personally, I, I don't find Professor Yen as um, compelling. So mm -hmm. I just, um, I, don't, I don't find him to be a main character. Right. But then it leaves things kind of hanging if the back of the book doesn't explain like how the cat and mouse is going to happen. Like that's also a part of the book. It's yeah. tricky. It's one of those where, I mean, from a reader perspective, I want to be like, this is an amazing story about a bunch of murder in Hangzhou. Please read it. Like, <laughs> I'm not very good at summing up a book, but a lot of people are not very good at summing up a book, I guess. It's a challenge. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, I think that you're right. Um, Luo Wen is probably the most interesting character the the, the thing that yan liang liang's got going for him is his method his because he's the detective of the story and how he has kind of his own unique quirk but i think we're gonna get on to that kind of question later on the next question i've got for you is um it's just had you read a lot of crime or mystery slash suspense novels before you took on the job of translating this one um, I tried to. I thought it would be helpful um, mm. because I do read crime fiction, but I wasn't necessarily reading with, with a critical eye or mm -hmm. paying attention to what the beats are. So I read Girl with a Dragon Tattoo and a couple of books like When Red is Black, uh, which are also set in China. Right. Um, just to get a feel for what I enjoy when I'm reading crime and also to kind of get a feel for what the dialogue is like or what pacing is like, um, which TV can also help for that. So I watch CSI Las Vegas every All single right. episode and took <laughs> notes. Um, but yeah, I mean, people can approach how to prepare for genre fiction translation however they like. And personally, my strategy is to kind of take the advice of others through reading and also always having a first reader so for this particular book, I asked a high school friend to read every single chapter before I even sent it to the publisher. Um, she idea. has no knowledge of Chinese, but uh, she reads voraciously and mm -hmm. gave me a lot of tips about when I might have been over explaining or when for her that seemed like something that was too cliche and mm. I could fix it up a little bit. There was a term that came up at the symposium. I don't know if this is a commonly used one or if it was just coined on the spot, but OR, Ordinary Reader. I guess yeah. it's it's important for um, anyone who's got a specialist knowledge and is working towards making a book to not just think about from the specialist perspective, but also if, if the book's going to the mass market, then what does a quote unquote ordinary person get out of the book? So in this case, do ha, what does the book look like through the eyes of someone who's not somewhat obsessed or at least interested or experienced in China and life in China? So it's smart of you to look for such a person. I mean, it's just for me that that feels like the right thing to do. Translation is 
very personal. Mm. And um, it's also, you know, the whole project is getting filtered through a lot of different people. But I think Amazon Crossing, one of the things that it does do right is that it um, tries to make books enjoyable for its readers. If Especially if it's genre fiction, we're not translating a high classic. We're translating something that can transport you to another place, but also give you all the excitement of a crime novel. Mm-hmm. So if that's the goal, then the goal should be, let's make this work as a crime fiction novel. Yeah, which kind of leads into the next question quite nicely. Um, So the only other kind of book you could call genre fiction that I've done on this podcast is A Perfect Crime by IE. So clues in the name, it's kind of a crime novel, but it certainly didn't feel like that's just what it was, like just a story or just a genre exercise. I kind of got the feeling, and it was hinted at in the kind of sleeve notes, that it was a bit of an existentialist book as well. So do you think there's anything quite as lofty in The Untouched Crime? Or do you think it's got an intellectual aspect as well as just being a good story? Um, I mean, I guess there's a couple things to chew on. Like, how far will you go to find an answer, maybe, mm-hmm. is something that you could chew on. but Which sounds very generic, but without spoiling anything, the book does... That's the best we can do, guys. (laughs) Go buy the book. Um, Whereas I think A Perfect Crime and Ai, that author in particular, like, it's just, it's very dark. It's very intense. And existentialist is probably an excellent way of describing it for how how Mm. deep it goes in just, you know, probably in the first chapter. Now, what's ironic is that I think, I'm pretty sure Ai worked in a public uh, security bureau, um, a police office, basically. He was a policeman, yeah. Um, in his previous life, but he he strives to create books that kind of have that depth that are really worthwhile. Whereas I think Zijin Chen is um, way more interested in crafting something that is going to be exciting for his readers. And mm-hmm. also, I think part of the reason why Hui Ru and Guo Yu are described the way they are is because I think that's who uh, normally reads Zijin Chen's books. Right. So not to say that it's lowbrow, but he just knows that these are younger readers that are interested in just getting more, 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 more. Whereas mm. Ie is he's like crafting for you know timeless books that will hopefully last for fifty years. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that's pretty spot on. Um. So I've I learned today just from you that this book started as a web novel, but I also learned, uh, I learned last night it's the first of a series called the King of Reason series. I'm guessing that the character Yan Liang is the King of Reason. So it's the in Chinese, what's that? Tui Li Zhi Wang Shi Li the yep. King of Reason. And I also learned just this morning, should have known this before, that there's a TV show of this book as well. Had you stumbled across that? A little bit. Um, I haven't watched the TV show actually, but. Um... You know, I'm excited that there's going to be more intention to it, I suppose. Maybe mm. someone will get interested in the book from watching the TV show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, I learned the action's relocated in the TV show. It's not in Hangzhou. It's up in Harbin. And they, oh, how funny. Yeah, and they milk it for the kind of old, you know, the pre-war architecture, the Russian, and I don't know, possibly Japanese, but the more kind of oldie Western style architecture of Har- Harbin, they milk it a lot. But it um, it tickles on something that came up in the um, symposium that I think I might be asking, I was planning to ask later on in the interview, but um, mm-hmm. about this concept of hot and cold crime that Western publishers seem to have, where if a crime story is set in, if it's Scandi Noir, basically, or if it's set in one of the more, more northern and wet and cold parts of the UK, that's cold crime. And if it's in essentially the Middle East or Asia, that's hot crime. And for every China um, buff in the room, that rubbed the wrong way because half of China, or at least the northern portion, is very cold. And yeah. I mean, on a emotional level, I feel like it's easy to make something mysterious if you can have a cold, foggy night involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so on that level, I feel like cold crime, hot crime makes sense. But otherwise, I think um, listeners, if they're interested in knowing more about this, they need to hurry up and become a Patreon yeah. because you covered it really well in your um, podcast that's for Patreon subscribers only. So that's the place to learn about this, guys. And I didn't pay Michelle to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. 
<laughs> yeah, but you're right. I shouldn't stray too far into talking about the minutia of the symposium because it is all there on the Patreon. So speaking of symposium things, um, we did find, I think Nick Stember mentioned, in some study, an AI was fed a huge corpus of uh, crime fiction to uh, and other genres uh, to analyze. And the things that the AI spotted about crime fiction that human readers might not is a lot of description of uh, places in the interiors of rooms. And there was talk of how a crime from from a, I think was it Jeffrey, what's his last? Yeah. Jeffrey Kinkley said crime fiction can serve as a travelogue, especially especially when it's uh, an expat writing set in China. But I think in general, and there was the hot crime, cold crime uh, discussion. So there was a general kind of consensus that crime you can a kind of side effect or an extra bonus feature of crime books is the sense of place. So. This story, The Untouched Crime, I knew going in it was set in Hangzhou because you told me and I learned quite quickly that it's not, it's it's a specific area of Hangzhou, it's the west kind of near Zhejiang University. So the north side, if for people who know Hangzhou, that would I guess be the north side of West Lake, not necessarily all the way out west past West Lake, but that region of Hangzhou, which I've been in a wee bit. Um, oh, I think that's the... If anyone hears my dog barking, that's the postman. Very good. Uh, yep. Yeah. Now, are you okay, mate? Uh, uh... Yeah, there was a parcel at the door. Yeah, so when you were uh, reading the this book or working on the translation of it, did you get much of the sense of uh, Hangzhou? Yeah, I think what's interesting about the book is that... Um, to me, it feels very much set in China and set in China, you know, of the 2000s. Mm. So I lived in China from 2009 to 2011, actually in Guangdong province, which is even further south. Mm -hmm. But I still think that there's a lot um, that seemed very natural to me, like constantly getting food at a restaurant. That's what we did yes. for two years. Just, you know, you never cook at home or um, having a lot of migrant workers and the relationship between people who are locals and people who are migrant workers um, and kind of the areas that are constantly covered by security cameras, like that ends up being a key mm -hmm. feature of the book. But I also found that that's very normal in China. Yeah. Whereas comparatively in the US, um, you really don't get that many cameras. It's only inside stores. Right. And I would say in the UK, it's kind of in a middle ground. You might find more cameras, but not to such a level that you could write a book like this. Yeah, I think that's about right. I think I think for British people, the CCTV coverage is less. It's not a shock, but I think it is noticeable, um, the, the, the higher number. But yeah, I, I think what you said, it matches my... Um, my picture as well, because I, I used to live in Zhejiang province my first year in China, and I would bus into Hangzhou for weekends to be in a city. Yeah. And yet, like specific Hangzhou things didn't leap out at me quite as much um, as I might have expected. But the kind of more ambient general stuff about second tier, like de developed but not futuristic cities in China where... Yeah, you can have a nice meal for a pound or two pounds or what, like two, three, four USD every day easily. The 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 the, the migrant workers who being behind the counter being noticeably different from the I guess the professional classes like Luo Wen and Yan Liang Liang. Um I'm I'm guessing that since the shop that Guo Yu and Hui Ru were or so the one that the one that Hui Ru was working at, that was called Chongqing Noodles. I guess we were to surmise that they were migrant workers from Sichuan. Yeah, that that would be the assumption. Although to be fair, the food that they serve is not necessarily Chongqing food. <laughs> yeah, I did notice that. <laughs> um, yeah. I think you mentioned before that the Chinese language version of the book isn't necessarily set set in Hangzhou. Is that is that right? Well, I think what's interesting is um, that the clues are very obvious for the Chinese reader so mm. that it can fly under the radar of anybody doing censorship or deciding to get offended. But the clues would not be obvious to your ordinary English reader. So right. there's no other city in China that starts with Hang. All right. There's only Hangzhou, and then he chose the city called Hangshi, and there's no such thing as a Hangshi in China. Mm -hmm. So based on that plus Westlake, I was like, hang on, this is 
basically supposed to be set in Hangzhou, and all the readers would get that very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then the only other city that's really mentioned a lot is Ningxi. Again, <laughs> not many cities out there that start with Ning. And there's the only one that's, exactly. There's only one that's close enough, really, to be a candidate. So mm-hmm. I emailed uh, the author and said, "Do you think it will be okay? Do you think you would get in trouble if we switch it directly to Hangzhou and Ningbo?" And mm-hmm. he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do that." So, in my opinion, I think we were making sure that the book had kind of the same effect because the only reason why that extra layer was introduced in the Chinese was to make sure to not get any extra trouble. No trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that sure? Is that the sure for city like Shanghai yes. sure Shanghai city? So Hang City and Ning City. Correct. Which we could have done that.、Yingbo. We could have done that, but it would have looked just silly. Like yes, that would have seemed like an anime or something. <laughs>、um, so last question about place. So I, I think I stumbled across in my dissertation doing my、uh, my reading was that it's often. Dissident or literary fiction from China that will have a blurb quote on the back saying a picture of modern China or something like a vivid portrait of communist China.、Um, so there's this idea that even fiction books get marketed as kind of nonfiction, as like a guide to the country,、uh, and genre fiction not so much. But if if you were trying to introduce people in more of an apolitical way to what China's like, maybe in a more ambient way, do you think this would be a good book to do it? I think it's a great way to start.、Um, there are some authors out there that mention that you know the U.S. is kind of a hegemon when it comes to culture. It's a big country, but we、uh, a lot of people have an understanding about it because there's so many movies that come out, so many books that come out,、yep. and so you realize that it's a very、um, you know it's a diverse country and there's a lot of things going on. Well, the same thing with China. It's a huge country, and if you only have read Wild Swans. <laughs> Or if you've only watched kung fu films with Bruce Lee in them, like really, you're not seeing the full picture.、No. So the hope for me is not necessarily that everybody reads、um, more nonfiction about China or more heavy hitting journalism about China, but just reads more, 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 so that they can see a more complete picture rather than just Beijing or just kung fu. <laughs> yeah. Because there's just so many things that are、um, going on, and it's worthwhile for everybody to know about that. Yeah, got two anecdotes that spring to mind immediately. One was this morning scrolling through Twitter. Never a good idea.、Um, <laughs> I saw some a fellow UK citizen, someone who's involved in publishing, saying, "Looking for some recommendations for my Christmas look, list of、uh, books. I want it, magical realism, feminism, and books about China, not Chinese books, but books about China." And first reply said, "Take it you've read Wild Swans, then." And the reply was, "Yeah." <laughs> and that was it for China recommendations. Wow! And、uh, well, yeah, I mean, perfectly fine recommendation. But when you're when you've got all these, you've got your own vested interests and people understanding the bigger picture, it does make you want to bash your head against the wall.、Mm-hmm. But to the other thing you said,、um, I think Ken Leo might have said this in an interview. He said something similar to me when I was sending him dissertation research questions. He said, "There's a bit," and I think other people. I think Kaiser Kuo from the Sinica podcast might have said something similar, but、um, the Western perception of China is often that it's a monolith. And he said there's a, or I've I've read from these people there's a lack of understanding that you could read it as a collection of many different cultures. Or I think that was what Ken Liu said, a collection of many different cultures. And I think what Kaiser Kuo said is it's in some ways it's more of an still an agrarian empire than a modern, a modern nation state. So a bit more grandiose language, but yeah, it's it's incredibly diverse. It's got even geographically, it's similar to、yeah. America, and then it's got just about every landscape you could wish for, and it's huge. And yeah, there's different. So that's different... really the only hope is that people realize how diverse it is and how many different things are going on at the same time. Yes, exactly. Well said.、Um, we could go on and on about that,、um, but. Last questions about the book itself, and we're going to try and do the story itself without spoiling things. So I had a question about the blurb, but we've already talked about the blurb. We did mention a wee bit about the characters.、Um, we could maybe go on, go in a wee bit more depth about them. So we have our two kind of, I guess you could call them our intellectual characters, Luo Wen, the、um, the well, we can't former forensics expert. There、maybe? you go. There you、uh-huh. go. And 
Yan Liang, the criminologist. The, so the two guys who end up in a sort of a cat and mouse. Um, they both struck me as fairly interesting. Law when maybe more so because he's more developed as a character. And the, to some extent, they're both a little bit strange. You could say even twisted, one of them maybe more so. But they're both fairly sympathetic. That's the impression I got. Did you get more or less the same impression? Yeah, I would agree that they're strange, but they are somehow very compelling as well. Mm-hmm. I think Lo Wen is is someone who, um, especially when he keeps on having these flashbacks and things, you realize like, oh, there's a lot going on in his head, and he's yeah. uh, he's got a lot of weight on his shoulders. And Lian, Yan Liang, similarly, you know, he was in crime and then he left and he went to teach as a professor he's got a lot of things going on equally intelligent it's just that it's not so developed why he why he's no longer working in criminology Mm -hmm. but yeah for myself i think lo wen is the character where i see like more reason to believe with the actions that he took even though they are maybe more extreme yeah (laughs) yes um, I guess, I don't know if, if books 2, 3, and 4 will make it into English, but I guess since this is a series, at least in the original, Yan Liang might be, his arc might stretch over these four books, and perhaps there's going to be more than four. Whereas, I guess Luo Wen, I'd assume this is a one-off for him, so he's a fully rounded book within, fully rounded character within one book. Mm. Yeah. Um, did you have a character you were rooting for the most? Maybe, was it Hui Ru? Yeah, definitely when I was translating, that was the character I was most interested in because uh, mm. I was so excited to be translating a strong female lead. Right. Um, and I think she's fairly well developed uh, in terms of her motivations, in terms of her style and her personality, um, which was cool. Mm. But again, I, th- I think the second time around, different things kind of pop up to me. I also think it's super hilarious how Captain Zhao is like the the angriest and most uh, short-tempered character in the book. Right. So, like, sometimes he just cracks me up, like, being like, oh, Yen, you're driving me crazy. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Calm down, buddy. Like, you can't get every- all the answers at once. Mm. Yeah. My So in this one reading I've done, I was kind of waiting for uh, Yan Liang to appear. So when we were following, we were introduced to all a few other cop characters first and i know i know i think jao is maybe the most prominent of them yeah but to me they kind of blur together so if i was to go back and reread it those guys might be the focus for me to see how i can differentiate them yeah and i think some of those characters are you know like they have a full name but we don't learn enough about them to necessarily mm-hmm. follow them so that's i think that's part of the author's intent as well yeah, for sure. Um, last question about the story. Um, so literary detectives, they often have a bit of a signature approach. So uh, the first one that, well, the only one I've really read a lot, there's Sherlock Holmes who will spot one or two obscure clues and will extrapolate from them and he'll solve the case and then explain how he did it. Uh, can I think of another one off the top of my head? No, uh, but that's often uh, how these detectives' characters and stories work. They've got like a distinctive method or a style. What yeah. can you tell us about uh, Yan Liang's method or style? So he was classically trained, but he still enjoys being a little bit unorthodox. Mm-hmm. And um, he's, again, he's super smart. So right now he teaches, or in the book, when we start reading about him, he teaches mathematics. So in order to solve the what seems unsolvable crime, he uses quintic equations Yes. I've never heard of those before, so You're shout out. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to David Lonoff, who's a classmate from my college days and who now works at the University of Penn, um Pennsylvania, sorry, yep. University yep. of Pennsylvania. New Penn, I've heard of it. Bingo. Um because everything that's in the book like is really possible. And so basically the idea is is that if there aren't enough clues to work in the traditional conventional way of solving a crime, Mm -hmm. then maybe you have to use a substitution method. Think of who could possibly do it and then check if everything else you know about the crime fits still. So Mm -hmm. that's definitely unorthodox. And uh, uh, that's the nicest way to put it is unorthodox. But it's um, it makes it interesting. It makes it fun. Yeah. And I did feel speaking very generally, it did feel like a little bit of a a quote-unquote Chinese characteristic because was it? I think Yan Liang said Yan, Yan Liang. I don't know why I keep messing up Liang. Yan Liang says, "So you you guys all know about quintic equations, right? You must." Have oh studied. yeah. 
Because <laughs> obviously, and then one character says no, and the other character's like, "Yeah, I'm with you." Because <laughs> I, I guess, um, I don't know. I don't even know about England, but I know in Scotland, maths is compulsory until 16, and then mm-hmm. after that, you don't need to do it. And maths is at a lower level than than Chinese schools. You, um, if, if you finish at 16, and a Chinese person mm-hmm. were to finish maths at 16, they'd be ahead of you. Um, but yeah, if, if you're going to university in China, you got to do the Gaokao. Maths is part of the Gaokao. It can't be avoided. And there's more of a focus on maths. So, yeah. yeah I think, you know, if we compare it to sci-fi as it's done in the U.S. Uh, versus in China. In, in the U.S., we're allowed to do a little bit of hand waving and say, it works, just keep reading. Mm. And in China, like, it might actually be totally feasible or there might be real physics principles, real um, math principles behind what is going on in the story which is just excellent that they can make it work although i should say quite a lot of the really interesting sci-fi that is coming out in china and in translation from china is kind of what soft sci-fi so sci-fi that doesn't focus on the science so i know that's um, a good point so the two guests we had at the symposium chen chou fan and xia jia i don't think chen chou fan's sci-fi although it's not totally quote unquote soft I think it, it. I don't think it dives deep into physics or maths. And Xia Jia, um, her signature, her signature style is a porridge sci-fi. So it's soft, softer than soft. <laughs> I mean, and that's that's the beauty of it. Again, China is very diverse, and a lot of styles are accommodated. Absolutely. So I think that's all of our questions about the book. Now I'm going to ask you some translationy technical questions. So, Go for it. Yes. So first one, uh, we, we've kind of, um, you've mentioned this before, but um, you did have some contact with uh, Chen Zijin or Zijin Chen, as he's credited on the book, um, during your translation work. Did you, when it came to police terminology and uh, invest, procedural investigation terminology, did you have to, or did you query back and forth with him? Or did you, how, did you read up yourself? Or how did you deal with that stuff? Well, um, I definitely asked him a lot of questions. I think um, whenever possible, it's good to get that double check with the author. Mm -hmm. But you can't burden them with hundreds of questions. So I looked back. I asked about 20 questions. And some of them were stuff uh, that basically another Chinese person could not give me the answer to. Like, what does this look like? Or this person kicked this person. Where exactly are they supposed to kick them? Right. Um, and so those questions were not necessarily about police stuff, but just um, making sure I'm visualizing things correctly or if something logically doesn't work in my head, um, just clearing up the part that doesn't make sense. Okay. And then the other trick that I normally use when I'm trying to figure out how to say something is a lot of Google image search. Mm. So one of the characters um, who in the book is called Yellowhead is just um, a really annoying thug in the West Hangzhou area. Extremely annoying. Yeah. His his Chinese name is Huang Mao, which is more like yellow, yellow hair. fuzz, you know? Like right. Mao is really thin hair on your arms and legs, but mm-hmm. never mind that. He he has a haircut that's kind of it's not an actual mohawk. And so when I kept putting the words into kind of Google image search to see what it looked like, I was like, okay, so the middle kind of sticks up, but it's not shaved on the sides. I guess I could go for the word faux hawk. Yep. And the publisher marked that as a special word that was specific to this book. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Questionable. So is there a Chinese word for faux hawk? Oh, no. Now I have to go look it up, see what uh, I got. Okay. Right. Um, I don't remember what it was in the Chinese, but... That's okay. Yeah. No, but another one that came up was the overlay skirt. Oh, yes. I think once I read that, I was like, ah, yes, I've seen those in China. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it it comes up if you look for it in English, those two words. Mm -hmm. And again, I did have kind of an American friend check for me, like, do these two words make sense when you see them? And she said, yes. So it's basically, it's like a mini skirt as the under layer and then a sheer or mesh kind of over layer that goes all the way to the ankles. Mm-hmm. And that was, it was actually really key for the reader to understand that quickly and not have yeah. to do any research, not have to put a footnote that would pull the reader out of the story. So I spent a lot of time on just one little piece of clothing. <laughs> yeah. 
creating exactly the right mental image it it does it does factor into the plot really so it's good that you got it exactly right thanks yeah the um next translation question this one is about the uh, not the chapter titles because the chapters are just numbered but the book is also broken into parts and those have titles and i really liked a lot of the titles they had names i thought were pretty cool so there was this isn't all of them but these are my favorite ones um come and get me the tragedy of the logician an equation without a solution the magnetic pool of the truth um so did you have to kind of think hard or do cunning translation to get these cool titles or were they kind of ready made for you by Zijin in the chinese yeah i think actually Zijin came up with really good section titles and they ended up going over very easily um stuff that's short sometimes is harder to translate because there's not enough context mm. but this book in particular it's not you know referencing chinese music or certain chinese warriors that we might not know about in the uk and us you know readership yep it's just kind of talking about stuff that uh, we can readily imagine so it was pretty okay perfect um Another question of this one about going back to the idea of genre. So this is a, a genre book. It's fairly entertaining. It is fairly light. Do you think that makes the translation job easier or harder? Or is it just like apples and bananas compared with a more literary, kind of quote unquote literary book? I would say it's a teensy bit easier. Um, this book, for example, it doesn't have any poetry. Mm, right. And again, um, it's set in modern times, so you don't have like weird farming equipment <laughs> or just, you know. Millstones. Some, yeah, millstones would be exactly what I'm thinking about right now or something that you would expect the average reader to have trouble picturing. Whereas my first book had a lot of references to Chinese culture, like more traditional stuff and I think three poems. When you say your so first book, is that, is that Beijing, Beijing? Yes. Right, Fang Tang's book. Yeah, I, I think it popped up on the podcast before, but um, I think you can find pretty quickly reading translated Chinese books um, is Chinese fiction often has poetry in it, a little bit like Tolkien books do. Oh, so that's maybe, an interesting maybe, comparison, yeah. Yeah, not a perfect analogy, um, but less, more appropriate than the um, Chinese Lord of the Rings uh, quote on the front of the Jin Yong books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, but I guess a lot of the poetry you'll you'll find in Chinese books will be an allusion or a quote to classical Chinese. The one that pops right into my head is in it's Leave Me Alone, Murong Chue Tun's book again. There's a character in that who's a little bit melancholy and literary, and he quotes poetry or he occasionally says a line of poetry. And then at least in the English version, it's rendered slightly, um, it's italicized and it's indented. And yeah, it's an interesting thing, and it, it, I think it works fine in the English translation, but it does. It's a thing that I think characterizes the Chinese books I've read in English. I just think it's a, a very different skill. So right. being able to translate dialogue is one kind of skill. Being able to translate the prose is a slightly different skill, and then the poetry comes out there. You have less room to play with. You need mm -hmm. to double check the multiple meanings of the word and. In Beijing, Beijing in particular, the main character comes up with a poem, like uh. while drunk, and it's a <laughs> terrible poem. He comes up with another poem about somebody that he has a crush on. Again, just terrible poem. So you have to like translate it so that it's equally dumb. Yeah. And then he trans uh, he brings up a poem that's oh, hundreds of years old. I don't even remember which one it was. And mm -hmm. so at that point, it's a different kind of Chinese. Of course, yeah. I'm pretty okay at modern Chinese, but I have very little experience with old uh, Chinese or even ancient Chinese. So at that point, I need to look up the original. Mm -hmm. That's classical Chinese, right? It, yes, class. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. It was so I just started reading *The Waste Tide* on the bus yesterday. Um, Chen Xiu Fan's book, translated by Ken Leo, uh -huh. and uh, Ken Leo put it quite nicely uh, and succinctly. He said. Uh, Classical Chinese is a literary language, so it's the language of the, the literati from ancient China. So it's a totally different world from spoken Mandarin or vernacular Mandarin. Yeah, so it's just a giant headache. It like swallows your whole day, even though it's only 80 words or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a big challenge. Okay, so speaking of things that eat up your time, 
Um, I know you mentioned Google Images. Did you have any other kind of techniques or tricks or time savers to help you out with your work? Every book is a little bit different. And mm. as you go along, you pick up more tricks. So I think when I was starting, um, I definitely relied a lot on informants, um, double checking with Chinese friends, double checking with American friends, um, just regularly checking, does this make sense? Does this work for you? Mm -hmm. And then I think in the second book, slightly, it was a little tiny bit easier. But more tricks that I ended up using was um, just kind of seeing if it could be pictured or if other books would say it like that. Um, for mm. example, the the Gong An Ju is um, literally translated or officially translated as Public Security Bureau. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't sound like police station. No, no. And so then the question is, like, do you want to really domesticate that and call it police station? Or do you keep it as Public Security Bureau and think the readers will figure it out? quickly enough as soon as I keep seeing police officer, captain, etc. Yeah. So that was just checking with uh, When Red is Black, they write Police Bureau. Mm -hmm. And uh, even given that information, I decided to stick with Public Security Bureau. So more like trusting your gut a little bit more was the, <laughs> the trick yeah. for the second book. Yeah. I think that's a tricky thing in editorial, be it in styling how a page is designed or, or spellings. Like, do you have a do you try and have a consistent style, or do you um, fine tune things for their particular context? And it seems like it's always you have to take each decision case by case. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, a lighter question, and I hope you've got an answer ready. Uh, can you teach us an untouched crime uh, themed word of the day? I would love to do that. Hell yeah! So, a word that gave me a little bit of trouble is shui guo dao. Shui guo dao, okay. So shui guo is fruit, mm -hmm. and dao is knife. Fruit knife, okay. Fruit knife, which sounds odd in English, so the translation we use for the book is paring knife. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that's a good one is, first of all, it's a weapon that's used in the book. <laughs> yeah. But also, um, it's interesting that all of the weapons used in this book are not guns. So mm. from a... Um, from my perspective of the books that I've read, usually um, people might be killed because they're shot. And that's because in the U.S. it's so easy to access a gun. So I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas in China, it's incredibly difficult. And so I even added a sentence in the translation, like tried to weave it in so it's not super annoying. But just noting that the first choice for a killer is not going to be a gun because it's so difficult to get one. Here, let me see. If someone wanted, this is this is page 24. Okay. If someone wanted to commit a murder, a knife was the easiest and most reliable way to do it, since guns were all but impossible to obtain. Sure. Why would the killer make the job more difficult by using a jump rope? Mm. So those were, you know, that's the word that is exciting. But also it's just interesting that actually I don't know very many words for guns because it just doesn't come up in China, not in literature, not in the news. It's just they mm -hmm. don't get talked about. Yeah, I guess that might be an example um, of something Chen Xiaofan talked about at the symposium where getting books from Chinese into English, the, the market that Chinese publishers think about, it's America. And that means the decisions they make are all decisions to cater for American readers. So like if you were, if America didn't exist and you were selling this book to <laughs> the UK or the ang an Anglosphere based on UK English or UK yeah. culture, contemporary UK, we, you know, guns thankfully aren't easy to get here unless it's an air rifle. So that's true. The yeah. weapon of choice would be probably a blunt instrument or a knife. Yeah. A hammer or something. That's hammer. a really good point. Yeah. Or if you're in <laughs> Glasgow, a machete, but. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> um, no, knife crime in Glasgow is not as bad as it was. But um, yeah, I, I did. I did notice that sentence, um, and it did. It did not jump out as one that you'd stuck in. So it worked fine from my point of view. Glad to hear it. Yeah. So that's all the technical questions I've got. Let's just review our our word. Shui guo dao, right? Shui guo dao. That's shui, the one. Shui guo dao. I'll put that in the show notes. So, with that noted, um, some questions about yourself. Um, First one. So um, how did your connection with the Chinese language begin? I actually started learning Chinese when I was 18. 
Right. Um, when I was just about to start college or university, um, my dad was like, oh, look, you could take Chinese, Jap- uh, Chinese 101, Japanese 101. What do you think? And mm. I thought, oh, well, Chinese would probably be useful. I heard about that in some kind of speech given to high school students before. Let's try that out. And go. our first lesson was given entirely in Chinese by just an amazing, amazing professor. And I fell in love with it. Basically within 10 minutes. <laughs> so it was awesome. it was always hands-on. My connection was always, oh, what's China doing right now? And mm-hmm. how can I use the language? But yeah, it's, once I started, I never looked back. Yeah, I remember my first Chinese lesson. And it wasn't all in Chinese, but it was um, immediately getting us to speak some words. And it, it did feel really good. Yeah, because um, it's yeah. just so... It, it's a new world and everything is so interesting and fun. It's, oh, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And it, it definitely contrasted with when I was learning German in school, maybe because I was inside China. But um, when I was learning German, not too many of the words needed to be explained to us in context. Like uh, maybe maybe because it's a more similar culture, but also, I don't know if they just don't teach it that way. But when you're learning Chinese, I f- it seems like whether I'm self-teaching or whether a teacher is teaching me, there's often a lot of fun context or cultural stuff that you learn along with it. So it's more satisfying to me than learning a mainland European language. I can agree. I just always found it fun, fun, fun. Even mm-hmm. I mean, even though it's hard, it's yeah. definitely hard. It's uh, really satisfying. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so following on, were there any pieces of Chinese literature that made an early impact on you? Um, I think that the first one that comes to mind, because I've probably read other stuff, but it didn't stick as much, mm. would be Rickshaw Boy. Is that Lao Shu? Yes. Yes. And I remember like kind of feeling like that was very Chinese and some of the phrasing was Chinese, but also like it made sense, like it, it passed the gut check. The mm. idea, the the one sentence that I think I wrote down even was, there won't be another inn when you get out of the village. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, take advantage of something before the opportunity passes you by. And so even though parts of that book, I was like really annoyed at the main characters. <laughs> mm-hmm. I found it really fun to read about something that took place somewhere else in a completely different time. And yet still seemed plausible, seemed like characters that you know i could be friends with i could know sure i think um i had a wee bit of a similar experience so the first probably the first chinese fiction that made a big oomph impact on me was the three body books and the characters sometimes they're like they'll do something that seems strangely either seems very foreign or very sci-fi, um, but at the same time, there's like a logic to the whole thing that was very relatable. So yeah, um, I get I get when you said about the thing about making sense to your gut. I think it it's uh, it feels good when you're reading something from a quote unquote totally different culture, but there's stuff that hits you on a deep level as just common sense or true. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we talked a wee bit about the setting of this book. Um, being Hangzhou and you mentioned how just the kind of day-to-day stuff matched your experiences in uh was it Guangzhou or Guangdong the province you were in yeah it was Zhuhai which Zhuhai. is okay. a small city of only 100 uh, 1 million inhabitants oh tiny tiny yeah yeah tiny um so most of my experience in China is from the south because that's right. where I lived the longest, but I'm very lucky in that I got to see Beijing and Shanghai and a whole bunch of cities on the coast. And I've right. also been to Chengdu and Omeishan, so I've seen a little bit of the West. Because mm-hmm. um, it, it's China is so big. I don't know much about Asia in terms of seeing things firsthand. Sure. But I've been to probably 20 cities in China, and each one has its own personality. So it's really cool to be able to... Absolutely. Kind of see a country in depth instead of just see a lot of countries and only scratch the surface. Mm. So did you see, did you visit Hangzhou much? We went as part of uh, my study abroad program. Mm-hmm. And I seem to remember being extremely jet lagged. Ah. So we were on West Lake and all I wanted was to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> was it completely rammed? Um, well, I think it was mostly us on the boat, 
but oh, okay. all I could remember was it was sunny, it was gorgeous, and all I wanted was to take a nap. That is my deep impression of Hangzhou. <laughs> Fair enough. It's certainly relaxing being out on the boat on Westlake. Um, yeah, yeah. Especially if you've come off the one of the touristy shores and it's the, the only ocean is a sea of people and then you hop on the boat and then suddenly you're on your own in this pretty sizable man-made lake. The next question I've got, it's about, I suppose, about the future, this one. Um, which Chinese author or authors would you jump at the chance to translate? Um, this is this is a tricky question because mm. as I continue to translate stuff, I start realizing that uh, a good way to get into literary translation is to read a lot and have a couple of projects that you're trying to find homes for, mm. which is how Jeremy Tiang, a friend of the show, definitely would put it. Um, he is very talented and he has 10 books that he's trying to find a home for at any time. Um, right. The two authors that I would love to find a home for but haven't quite got everything to line up yet are Anai and Song Aman. So right. after talking to Ai Yi, um, an author who I really, really respect, I realized that I should try to put my efforts into translating someone that I think does really good work and like deserves a whole year of attention and careful translation. And for me, that means translating a woman author that maybe nobody else would get a chance to hear. Sure. So there's a book called Ode to Joy, Huan Le Song, Huan Le which Song. was turned into a TV show. And the hmm. TV show was the most popular show of 2017, if I remember right. In China. Yeah, it was massive. It was huge. Ooh. So I watched the TV show because that's easier than reading. <laughs> so I've heard. And uh, kind of fell in love with it, bought the books, realized that the characters in the books are uh, better developed and they're really interesting. Mm. And then realized that this particular author um, doesn't like interacting with the public. Okay. And this particular publisher is not very easy to contact by email, which would be my main method of So you're giving yourself a nice, easy task then? Well, basically that one's on the back burner at yeah. this point. <laughs> And then the other author that um, trying to find a home for her first book, um, her name is Song Aman, okay. and she has a master's in uh, literature, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. She's a little bit younger, um, but she's published a lot online, and Paper Republic has one of her stories published in okay. English, so you can look for that. Um, and she, she's got like a really slow but detailed style and again something about the way she writes my gut just checks with it and I'm like mm. this story is believable I want to meet these people in real life why can't I meet them in real life mm -hmm. um, but she also weaves like either stuff from history or painting or kind of architectural features that only exist in China mm -hmm. into her present day works Ooh. and so I just I think she's phenomenal and what we need is some publisher to make the commitment because she's easy to contact um, where right. um, I'm emailing with her and stuff, but it's still, it's a big risk. It's a big investment yeah. to translate a book and to find the readers to, you know, connect the readers to the book that you've translated. Yeah. I feel an advantage I have with this podcast is if I do something obscure and not many people listen and inter are interested, it doesn't really matter because so long as I keep paying the SoundCloud hosting fee, it's there for posterity. But for print <laughs> publishing, like they could do a print run and it never sells and then they just have to pulp the books. So even if they take a risk and publish the book, the book could still vanish. It could be, you know, they could sell X number of copies and have to pulp the rest. So... Yeah. yeah, risks. Do, these things are risky. Uh, what kind of stuff does Song Aman have? Uh, what kind of stuff does she write? Like, what's the content of her stories? I think if we put it into a Chinese category, it might be Du Shi Xiao Shuo. It's okay. it's not exactly on the romantic side. I think it's. I mean, I think most of her stories fit in more of a high literature, literary fiction category. Okay. But some of them end up being really gruesome. Some of them end up being kind of sweet and sour, a little bit bittersweet, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, she has a really good range. Yeah. Du shi xiao shuo. Uh huh, which means urban novels or urban fiction. Du, du shi, is that du for capital, shu for city? That's the one. Hey, okay, I've learned a new word. Du shi xiao shuo. Yeah. All righty. Um, what are you reading right now? doesn't have to be something related to China. 
And are there any books, Chinese or otherwise, you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Definitely. Okay. A book that I would recommend to people who are interested in tri- translated Chinese fiction okay. is Good Night Rose by Chi Zijian. That was the penguin book we mentioned earlier. It was translated by Poppy Toland. Yep. And it's just a sweet little novel. Um, something that is so different from the other stuff that you get. And also the, the descriptions are really vivid. So it just transports you for that while you're in a different city. You just feel like you're sitting in the same room as the characters. Mm. Really, really lovely book. And gosh, let's see here. How many pages? It's less than 200 pages. Oh, there you go. You could knock it's that back on a weekend. a sweet little read. Exactly. Yep. On a rainy day, be perfect. Mm-hmm. Two other books I'd recommend. Currently, I'm reading The Secret Barrister. I'm not sure if that's fiction, actually, but it's, oh, right. uh, it's anonymous. Ooh. So it's by, <laughs> by Christian Mark. Um, that book has been really fun because right now I'm studying a lot about law, English and Welsh law. Okay. And uh, he's just a little bit of a cynic. So seeing how he looks at things is really, really fun. My, cool. my final recommendation, which is back to fiction, but mm-hmm. originally published in English, is House of Leaves. Oh, yes. By Mark Daniel Lucy. Oh, yes. That's a great book. <laughs> because it's uh, Halloween time, and Halloween is basically my favorite uh, favorite time of year. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a so. fantastic book. Uh, yeah, you've read it. Wow. Yeah. I did a stupid thing. Well, an, uh, let's say al- an alternative thing. I, I got it as a PDF and read it on a Kindle. <laughs> Okay. Not, not even as an ebook or some interactive thing. So I was like spinning, spinning the Kindle around and you going through the settings and rotating the pages. And probably don't do that. Um, do what <laughs> I did later and actually order the real book. It's a much better choice. Because also, this isn't a spoiler, but there is a sort of haunted house in House of Leaves. Mm-hmm. And every time the word house appears in any context, it's blue. The rest of the text is, of course, black. And my Kindle screen was black and white. So I wasn't seeing that at all. Oh, no. So, yeah, it's a big book. It's like massive. Yeah. But I think it's like an investment for your life anytime you want <laughs> something <laughs> scary. That's You can dip into that. Yeah. Although it never, it didn't scare. I can, I suppose it's hard to be scared by a book. It's certainly got excellent creepy. And creepy is a better word than horror. Yeah. That's a really good point. But I get, yes. I have a low threshold. So <laughs> this, is, <Fair> enough. <laughs> this is like my limit. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a, oh, you made me want to read it again. So final question for you. Um, something we touched on at the start, but here's a chance to go all out. Um, is there any of your own work and or platforms that you'd like to plug for the listeners who want to know more about you and your, your endeavors? Um, so at the moment, I'm writing articles on LinkedIn. Oh, um, so you can search LinkedIn and my name, Michelle Dieter, and they'll just come up whether or not you have an account. That doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, just trying to kind of uncover things that are tricky in translation or interpreting. So interpreting being the spoken form of translation. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can check those out. They're pretty short and hopefully interesting. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, if you want to contact me, there's a way to do that on my website. And I'm always interested in helping beginner translators so go ahead and send me any questions you have. Mm-hmm. And the the books that you the China books that you translated that people can get. So of course there is the Untouched Crime from Amazon Crossing, mm-hmm. Beijing by Jing by Feng Tang from Amazon Crossing, and you co-translated uh, Paper Tiger with Nikki Harmon by Shu Zhuyuan, and that's a non-fiction about what is it about actually? Basically about the way China was changing between 2009 and 2014 when the book was published. Mm -hmm. So I think it's still very insightful. And Xu Zhiyuan is just a really amazing guy. Just it's well written and very insightful book. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, China has changed again. (laughs) Ah, So it's out of date. (laughs) So it's it's a little bit of a kind of a slice of that period of time. So uh, for those people that are interested, yes, I'd recommend that book. Mm -hmm. Some of the other stuff I've translated is, uh, I actually have one book that was translated by a university press or by a Chinese press. Um, so it's maybe not necessarily very easy to find. But, but it's out there. It's out there. I mean, if you're looking for my name on Amazon, just see what comes up, I guess. Um, no. <laughs> my most recent book that I translated was called Work is Life. Okay. 
and that's by Che Jianxin. And okay. it's kind of an airport book, kind of a、um, self-help or advice book for anybody that wants to do better in work. <laughs> and he's he's a, a very funny billionaire. He's a funny guy.、Um, but it, it falls in this category that's not、um, like it's not quite nonfiction. It's it's more of a self-help book. So、mm. if that's not your cup of tea, like don't worry about it. You don't have to buy that book. <laughs> no, we won't force you. But yeah, exactly. That, that's cool because I didn't know about that one before. But yeah, I think that's as much as I can possibly interrogate you. We've we've got on for a good length of time, so thank you very much for coming on the show, Michelle. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Have a very nice day. Thank you. You too. So that was a fantastic interview, and this is the point where I'm gonna wrap the show up.、Um, just two wee notes.、Um, First of all, that academic publisher that、um, Michelle couldn't quite remember—that's Sage. That's the publisher. And on Jeremy Tiang being a friend of the show,、um, so I mentioned before I bumped into him, or bumped—I guess bumped into him at the London Book Fair this past year. And also, I've had an exchange with him on Twitter、uh, when we did the episode on his play Ocean. Oh, sorry, Chen Zhan's play Ocean Hot Pot, translated by himself.、Um, I summarised the story of Ocean Hot Pot. In an emojis,、um, a tweet, all emojis of the plot of the play, and、um, Jeremy retweeted it and said,、uh, "What was it? Sometimes I wish I could be a translator of Chinese to emoji rather than English." And that made me, that made my day.、Um, if that qualifies him as a friend of the show, then that's what he is. But yeah, that is,、um, that is us. So just to reiterate the plugs again,、um, Twitter. Angus likes words. Instagram Trichfic T R C H F I C.、Um, that's where you can keep up to date on the show, and you can reach out to give me sc- scolding, scalding, hot criticisms.、Um, s- scalding, hot scoldings. Yeah, there we go. For anything I've got wrong, or anything, any points you'd like to bounce back on, or indeed any suggestions for the show, or if you'd like to be on the show, you're more than welcome.、Uh, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have translated something. If you've read something that's translated in Chinese and you think you could talk about it with me, you can be on the show. I feel like it's been too long since I last said that. So yeah, it's not experts only because I'm not an expert. I am someone who's learning as I go along, and who's not actually that well read. Even if I try and make it sound like I am, so yeah. If if, if、uh, you enjoy the show, just to reiterate, the places where you can help me cover the SoundCloud hosting fees are BuyMeACoffee.com/TrueTrafic. Links in the show notes. That's for a one-off contribution, and to get access to the bonus content and for a monthly contribution, there's the Patreon. Patreon.com/TrueTrafic. That is all. Remember, the very best way to help promote the show or support the show is. Well, it's by promoting it. So tell your friends, your family, your criminologist, your cover-up artist, your Chongqing noodles waiter, just whoever might listen, whoever might be interested. I will be infinitely grateful. Zai, Jian.